There we go. Um, that's fine. I was going to say, I'm sure he noticed that the light went off as well. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so um, good morning, everybody. I just wanted to say that whenever we have, as we know, we have an opportunity, and we've been talking about this since when and then, since we keep seeing each other and say, well, what date and when and how, and then suddenly um, it is look it's already and then we're just checking quickly when can we have a little bit of time right when can we have a little bit of time because there is no better um toxins positive vitamins than a vitamin of rabbits and altuski well i hope so I hope so. Hashem. so just before we start i just wanted to say firstly we, thank we you have a big injection I'm at Gabenshlael, good news, that's in Bowie. Yeah, but you're going to tell us all about that if we're ready for that. Uh -huh, uh -huh, uh -huh. <laughs> yeah. So, we made our sukkis really something. Who ever thought that we'd get a hold of him? Really mm -hmm. I, I think Rebus and Altuski were somewhere behind all of this. Girls, come in, you can come squash into these chairs. Oh, yeah, no. come in. So, before uh -huh. we're just about to begin now, I just wanted to thank. Um, the Stone family for opening up their beautiful home, and it should always be used for for symptoms and all good things. But as Hashem, and also just want to say that part of the share has also been um, in the sechus of Yehuda Yerucham ben Shalom, and because one of the things that we are all doing right now, and we've been doing for a long time, I'm just going to very quickly take some chutzpah and say. I just needed to please share this very quickly again, because the amount of times that I've said the story is uh, just goes beyond. But um, we have a very dear friend, the Perez family, and their son, Daniel Shimon, Lauren Eliezer, was actually shot on the 7th of October on Simchas Taira. Last year. He was on Simchas Taira last year. He's a command, he was a commander of a tank. But he was missing for 163 days. And during that time period, there was also, if anybody, oh. post, uh, oh. uh, cause somebody is not um, new to their needs, thanks. And uh, we had, there was a post put out by somebody by the name of Batsheva Sadan. And she tells the story. She says she called her son in Gaza and she said, when you come home, what do you want to do? And he said, I want to have a picture of the Beta Mikdash in our home. You know, what do we think somebody wants to do? They're going to come and get their favorite oh, food and what they want to have. And uh, he said, because in every place, in every space, in every room that they go into, um, there's a picture of the mosque. And they want to make sure that, um, that there's a picture of the Beta Mikdash. Not of the Quartel, but of the Beta Mikdash. Not where we are, but where we want to be. So in the Zuchus, of at that time, we were hoping that Daniel Shimon was still alive and we were davening for his safe return. We now daven for the return of his goof and we do this on the town. That he's in Gaza. They know they've seen the footage, they've seen him. Well, he's a few, he's a Hatuf. He was, no, he was, well, no, he was, he's a Hatuf, as, but as a, as a goof, he was killed as a commander of a tank. And for 163 days, and this project was in the making at that time. And um, we decided to continue with it. We had to change all the wording because it was we had already done the papers that said in the zakhus of his return. And then we had to say Le'ilun Nishma. So, so this project has gone ahead. Rebetzin Rachel Silva said that Daniel loved this project because when he got, that was the time that they could come, that the army could come and verify that it had actually, in fact, already been um, shot on Simchas Taira. But 163 days is 613. And he is there with HaKadosh Baruch Hu and sending and continue for us to all Who push this. It out, the, the wow. it was just the numbers, Max, and it was actually mine. What do you think of that? <laughs> <laughs> so we're very blessed to be able to do this and so far these pictures are in actually thousands of people's of homes and I can tell you that we have given out magnets two and a half thousand 
of these magnets. So we want them to go further. I've just run out of pages and waiting for them oh, to be. Yeah, and then yeah. this is what they call a block. You know, Israeli style, they are block. For them, it's a block. And these um, blocks, actually, um, there's a donation of five pounds for the blocks. The magnets are for you to take. And then what we do with any of the money that comes in, we buy things for Chaya Lot and for Chaya Lim. And we continue just to mitzvah, gorerit mitzvah, and just bring all of Klal Israel together. And you know Lynn Myers, Rabbi Shalom Myers and his wife tonight, she called to say Shalom is Franco, actually went tonight. They are dancing. They've got a party, a Simchas Beis HaShoeva for women, soldiers at the base. And they called me an hour, a couple of hours ago and she said, guess where I am? I said, are they at the Kotel or Kever Rochel? Mm -hmm. And she said, no, on the way to Gaza, they're on their way to the route to the south and they go in and spend time with the higher lot. So you'll all take one of these when we leave. And if anybody wants a block, you can take one as well. And now we will hand over to our very special reps. Well, I, what I plan to speak about, I will soon speak about, but I wanted first to give a little chizuk. Mm -hmm. Times, times like this, I think, I come from Eretz Yisrael, I'm here for Sukkot, but in Eretz Yisrael, we have a war going on. There's a war going on, believe it or not. My daughter is the Rabbanit of Afakim. And Apokim is about 15 minutes away from the war zone. And I say to her, Maydala, do you hear the bombing? She said, by day we're too busy. It's only at night that we hear the bombing. Constant bombing. And she says, every time a helicopter flies over her, her house, she takes out the Tehillim. And she says, Mommy, I say, how much can I say? We have helicopters flying all the time. Helicopters bring the wounded from the uh, from the war zone, which is about I don't know between twelve to fifty minutes drive from her house. She says, "Mommy," she says, "What should I do?" I take out my my tillum and I say, "Miss Martillum, what should I do? What can I do?" Mm -hmm. As the Rebbitzin of Apokim, she is constantly on the phone, constantly on the phone, giving chizuk to the parents of those boys that are, I can say, or of the people in Apokim that hear the constant bombing and they're scared and they don't know what to do and they worry and they pray. So we live, like you say, between the Hezbollah missiles in the north, between the Hamas and the south, between all the chizuk that we have to give. We need chizuk too. Sometimes it's harder to hear it than to be in the middle of it, sort of. You know, when you're in the middle of it, you, you, you know what's going on. When you hear it from far, sometimes it sounds even worse. When you live with it, somehow Hashem gives the koyach to, to, to hear and to pray and to go on. And sometimes when we're far away, you know, imaginations play in and all kinds of uh, different uh, anxieties. You hear this one, that one. And who doesn't have, like you say, a pekala that they carry on their back? You know, this is just an, an addition to what we carry each one of us who doesn't have, who doesn't need what we call a personal, a personal goal, a personal, you know, every one of us has things and issues that we have to live with for our, our, our loved ones close enough so that their issues are our issues. And we need chizuk. And I thought of one, of two things before I start to talk about what I'd like to talk about, since it's now 
uh, in the middle of Sukkis and until Hoshana uh, uh, Rabba, our, our decree is not final. Whatever, mi yichyeh or mi yamut, who's going to be rich and who's going to be poor, who's going to have peace of mind and who's going to be anxious. Now, mi yishalev, shalva, or mi yitiasar, who's going to have you soon? Uh, anyone who's anxious knows that anxiety sometimes is more painful than any kind of physical pain. So I thought to start with I, something that always gives me physical, two little stories, and then maybe I'll go in to an Indian that'll help us, each one of us, to have the best kind of a pet deck, the best kind of a pisca table, like you say, a good report upstairs and a beautiful evening, despite everything. As a yid, we all know, we're adept, like you say, at hearing the words, hoping for the best, always praying for everything possible and knowing that Hashem is there for us in every way that's possible. I was even reading just, just today, yeah, this, you know, I don't always have time, I teach. Believe it or not, they're still keeping me, my seminaries. Um. I think it's too much money to just fire me. <laughs> you know what I mean? I passed 90. I'm not going to tell you how far. But but when I think that they still keep me, and I, every year you should know that way. Anyway? So, uh, you know, so in to have a lady. Yeah. Someone yeah. says to me, I, my balance is not all that good, but I haven't been that good since my accident, since I was 80. And that's a Quite a few years ago, I passed 90. So, you know, so they say, uh, my children say, Ma, you can carry, go with a cane. I said, that's all I need is to walk into the classroom with a cane. <laughs> <laughs> my wrinkles are enough. I don't have to prove anything more. Besides, they all know my story. You know, when I, when I came, that I came to to America, like you say, in 1935. Mm -hmm. It doesn't take long, and I was already four years old, to figure out exactly how old I am, you know? <laughs> They're very adept, my students, mm -hmm. at these kind of figures. Interesting to hear. <laughs> so, I wanted to just, yeah, yeah. Yeah. I'll just, I'll soon, I'll soon. So just today I was reading, such a beautiful thing. My son printed it out for me. I told him that, how do we think that Hashem is not there for us? How? How in heaven's name? Just today, yesterday, I said, Abba Moshe, I'm not going with that. You're printing me out. You know what it says? Our body function is enough to blow away to prove Hashem's love for us. The human heart, let's just listen to this. The human heart creates enough pressure to pump blood to 60,000 miles. 60,000. 60,000 miles of veins and capillaries. Capillaries, I'm sorry. <laughs> In one day, our blood travels a total of 12,000 miles. Ladies. Anyone who complains about a trip should take notice. <laughs> Our eyes can distinguish up to one million color surfaces and takes in more information than the largest existing telescope. We blink once every four seconds. I don't know. <laughs> because our eyelashes act as windshield wipers, keeping dust and grime from getting into the eye itself. Our stomach gets a brand new lining every four days. Ladies, I don't know. I didn't know all this. I have a book called This Wondrous World 
but it's in my cabinet. I don't look at it too often. <laughs> <laughs> so this is sort of reminding me. Huh? Imagine. This is a this is a mere fraction of the billions of miracles taking place each second in our bodies. Never mind the world and everything it encompasses. In in All right. That's enough for that because we don't have all that much time. Could you imagine that? Our stomach gets a new lining. Tell it to your kids, but don't say it too loud because with all the nash they take, maybe they're going to have to have a lining more often than every four months, every four okay. days. Okay. Every, every four days. Maybe they have to have it lined every day. <laughs> Just, I'm so impressed that I figured I'd share with you. I want to share with you, though, he's over. The best, I can have a comment. Where we will, Hashem asked us to make a Mishkan. In the Chumash, in the in in Sefer Shmois, he asks us to build them a mission. And Moshe Rabbeinu says to him, "How big? How? How big a Mishkan can we build you?" And Hashem says, "Lo lefi kochi, lefi kochachi, not according to my image and my." My, like you say, dimensions, according to yours, how much you can, and in human dimensional terms, as much as you can. Don't look at me, as much as you can. And then he says to him, and you all bring karbanot. That's the way we speak to Hashem when we had the Beis Hamikdash. We brought a carbon. If we were sad, we brought a certain kind of carbon, praying to Hashem to help. If we were joyful, we brought a carbon toda. Whatever it was, it was always a carbon to match what the message from our hearts was to go upstairs. So he said, no, just two. Carbons. One in the morning and one toward evening. That's all. Lefi kochachem. Lo lefi kochi. Not according to the image of Hashem. Ah, how much? How much? No, just two. One in the morning, one toward evening. And then each of you will contribute to the maintenance of the Mishkan. You say, how much should we give? A half a dollar. A half of a coin, a dollar. Maybe it's, in those years, a half a dollar was worth a little more than just today's half a dollar. But minimal. The poor, not less. The rich, not more. Everyone is. That's all he has. And then the Chovetz Chaim writes a beautiful page on this Medrash. And he says, Hashem will never come and ask and complain about what you give and how you give it and when you give it, as long as you give. Each one, let be coho, according to what he can. There are people that have, like you say, mima makim from our depths. Some of us are deep, we're one big mama came with one big heart. Some of us had to schlep them a little further down, a little inside me, mama came further down. And some, like this big apicores that never was always, always antagonistic to any kind of brumkite. Anything that smacked of being religious? No. It's enough with Jews. We don't need more. And yet, when he was taking an operation, that was a matter of life or death. From his mama, Kim, he had a slip up. Believe me, he took a major operation of life or death. 
to pull out from him, Hashem, I need you. Help me. That's all. When did he ever turn to Hashem? When? Ever. Hashem, I need you. Help me. That's all. And yet no tefillah goes back unanswered. Only sometimes we don't realize that the answer is meant to help us. It's always there, but we don't always want to hear. We think that, you know, you press a button and right away, not always, no. But no tefillah goes on end. Of course, if he comes, like you say, with more sincerity, it carries more weight. But Cholale, with a whole heart, carries the most weight. But who can judge? And who can tell? Like you say, sometimes looking at a person, you don't realize how much heart lies in everything he does. I ought to have, I should have brought the I must give it to you and you'll give it to the ladies. It's called the human, the human judge. It's such a beautiful thing. How we, we judge without realizing how much each human being, each yid, and I'm talking about Goyim now, each yid has within himself to give. And let's hope that happiness will come our way, happy days. So we can give but with a full heart, but it doesn't mean that our heart is not full other than, like you say, when we're happy. And happiness itself has so many, means so many, so many different things to so many different people. Happiness can be having a child. I pray for so many ladies who have no children. So many of my own teachers had no children. So Rishni was tell me don't. They were my my teachers. If I was my only yichus, and I repeat it, and I have said it so many times, was not that my grandfather was the hero of all for the boss. No, that was my luck. My muzzle that I had such a zady, all for the boss was my grandfather. My father, Rabbi Scheinberg, I think was also known to many people. That was my father. My children say I never spoke about my husband. <laughs> but my husband, as a matter of fact, wrote 46 svarim on the shots before he got out of hand. 46 svarim on the mesechtes of Angmaris. So I'm mentioning him as well. And I never met a person so intelligent and so tolerant as my husband. And I'm now one in many years. Yeah. Just to say, give you an example, what means when he found out he had Alzheimer's, he said, I don't mind for myself, but I feel bad for you to be married to a cliche bill, to a broken dish. Cliche of war called himself. I said, You call yourself a cliche of war when you wrote 46 farm on the shas? He has tapes on all of Tillam, tapes on all of Mishle, tapes on all of the Megillus, tapes and tapes and tapes. I was once riding in a, in a car, I got a ride. To go, I was staying in the five towns and I got a ride to Borough Park where I was staying in an apartment, you know, of a, of a good friend, a small pace of apartment. And the man said to me, the doctor, he, I was very lucky to get a ride on a Sunday morning when more 
most people are, you know, not using their cars. But he was a doctor in Maimonides Hospital in Borough Park, and he had to be there. And he says, please don't mind if I don't speak. This is my hour to learn. I have an agreement. It's called Inspire by Wire. I have an agreement with my phone company, and I get a, I'm get. i learning all of Nubu. He said, I went to day school, and, you know, they're not big on on uh, Nevi'im Achroinim. Nevi'im is showing him his stories. Nevi'im Achroinim is Musa. Uh, and I have a chance. I'm learning now Yeshayahu and enjoying it. So if I don't talk, you'll know why. And all of a sudden, my husband's voice goes on the wire. <laughs> <laughs> he didn't know who I was. I didn't say, they just said, would you mind giving a nice lady a ride? She needs to get the bar park. And I didn't say a word. And then at the end, and I thanked him. I said, I appreciate so much. I You, you enjoy my husband's. Uh, he said, I'll never get over. <laughs> Ladies, I have to share with you. My husband was prematurely grown. He had a white beard, which he kept. I mean, he, it happened to grow nicely. Some white, some beards grow, you know, all over the place. And they, my husband never cut his beard, but she happened to be looked very nice. And I'm wearing a nice blonde shade. And everyone is so disappointed when they find out that I'm the Rebbe. <laughs> you know, I feel like they... They look and say, you're the rabbi? <laughs> so that wonderful rabbi that wrote and has that long white beard. <laughs> it doesn't sort of go. It does. You know? Does. I once brought a whole bunch of svarim to a, um, to a uh, my mother-in-law kept the apartment. She could have gone into a very nice senior citizen's, you know, little apartment or like you say, yefida, a unit. No, she kept up the apartment just for my husband's farm and people bought. And I was delivering to the man who sold it, a rabbi Shapiro, based on, on uh, 12th Avenue, a whole, he needed more sperm of my husband's. And I walk in and he said to me, Bell's idea, who are you? <laughs> and I had to say, <laughs> Under <laughs> you had to see his face. <laughs> he was so disappointed. <laughs> Put it together. Okay. You know? Shay, I hope that in other ways I gave him a little knock as far as I'm <laughs> Looks wise. I was wipey and impressive, tall, and I, <laughs> this more little lady walks in with a shape. <laughs> We go. I tell you, I told you the story about what Hashem asks of us. According to what you can give each one. I remember going back to the story that I told. Hashem asked us to make the Mishkan. He asked us to make to bring our bonus not according to what we expect we would expect to give, but maintain I beg never to feel that someone gives more. Each one gives and tries to give as much as he can. I always tell my students, the ladies I work with, I work in groups with groups of women. I have degrees in this and that, so I work with a lot of ladies. And always, according to what you can. Don't, don't look at someone else, only inside. Inside will tell you how much you can get. If anything, work on yourself. That's the only one you're going to live with. I've made this one. That matters most. But you have to be true to yourself. With I always say, 
You do your best, and Hashem will do the rest. But there's only one little, one little issue here. Hashem knows what our best is. There we can shoot. But he pre every step he appreciates. Every step, every feeler, every word, every turning to him, never negate. Only you can judge how much you can give. And almost only you can judge what is the best. But again, we try. We try to do our best, and Hashem does the rest. We try, I always say, to do what's right, and Hashem will do what's left. Those two sort of guide the young ones, those who have yet younger children, those who have grandchildren, Baruch Hashem, you do the best, your best, and Hashem will do the rest. You do what's right, and Hashem will do what's left. Don't worry. Don't worry. And every tree and every worry, and that I, this is my, to my own gift to myself, every anxiety, if it's worth its weight, if it's important, turn it into a prayer. Every anxiety, Turn into a tefillah. And then know Hashem will give him help. I want to give you one more story of Chizuk. And that's that we never give up hope. Never, 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 never do we give up hope. I told them the story, I think, of my of my uh my aunt, Rebbe's and Shane. Well, maybe we can always listen again. Maybe I tell you. <clears throat> Not everybody. My aunt, Rebbe and Shane, who wrote the book all for the board, was a very literary lady, very academic lady. She loved to read. She loved to write, and she wrote a beautiful book called All for the Boss. Her own life was not an easy one. My grandfather sent her to the mill when she was a young, she wasn't quite 20. And at 20 years old, she had her first child in the mill. Her husband was studying. In America, there were very few yeshivas. When I grew up, and that was already Late, like you say, I grew up, and she was yet before that. They were in America three yeshivas. Zehu, who knew you? I J J, and then Rabenu Yaakov Yosef Yeshiva I J J, and there was Yitzchok uh, Hanan uh, without the university, and Torah Vidas more Hasidish in Williamsburg. That's why my Zadie sent my father to the mirror. Anyway, he also sent my Zadie, Herman, he sent my aunt to the mirror. And this is also by way of Chizuk and hasn't got what to do with really what I would like to speak about, so I'll make it that. I never do it, though. Thank you, Chase Man. I'm so <laughs> So what happened? The baby didn't come. There was only a mayaledet in the mirror. She had hands of gold. She was not a Jewish woman. She was a great. And she, she took care of all the towns around the mirror. She had hands of gold. But the baby was 12 pounds. And my aunt was my size. <laughs> and it just didn't go. It didn't go, it didn't go, it didn't go. It took so many hours. The head came out, but the shoulders caught. Until she got it out, 
and it was her expertise that saved that child, Bechlal. But my aunt was left with blood poisoning, which made her, uh, um, par which paralyzed her from the waist down. She was all of 20 years. The whole mirror cried. They were such a beautiful couple. My young girl was 25, tall and good looking, graduated already the university. Those years, there were no quite a little people went to the university, you know, if they were intelligent and academic. She was so clever. She was so, she had such a, she, 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 there was nothing she didn't read or know about. Brilliant woman, girl, young woman, young. Her professor said, he can't stand her. She never heard such a, a professor should come out and say, Mrs. Shane, I cannot tolerate having such a person in my in my class. And she said, But you give me A's on my all my my writings. He said, That's why I have never given an A before. You made me break my 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 custom of of demanding the best. I can't ask from you more. That's what he couldn't, he couldn't, he said, you made me break my, 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 what, what should I call it? My criteria, no, no one can get an A by me. But you just gave an A, I can't cheat. I'm an honest man. He was certainly honest to say what he said, <laughs> you know. Yes, I should come out with such a statement. I can't bear having you in my cinema class. She told him she'll pray for him. <laughs> she said, I'm a religious Jewish woman. I, I pray. I'll pray for you. You won't be able, you'll be able to bear me. So you may not want me in your class, but I enjoy having you for a professor. But that is that she got a smile. Okay, shame. It worked out. Yeah. Anyway, let's go back to my aunt. One day, my uncle was wheeling her in the wheelchair. She couldn't walk. She was paralyzed from the waist down. Her legs were an, an, a really a very unbecoming purplish color. And they were very swollen. And she was so shamed. She was so sweet looking and pretty. And she had such a nice figure, no, no, go, 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 no, from a birth. And she, she heard two young women say, look at that handsome young man, wheeling a cripple, stuck to a cripple. It was that night that she sent for the Mashiach, the Pratzko Levenstein from the mirror, he was well known with Hatzko. And she said to Rep Hatzko, she didn't call him Hatzko, she called him Kvod HaMashkiach. She was very good friends with his two unmarried daughters. So, but she still couldn't, she's not going to call him Kvod HaMashkiach, she said, I called you because I want to give my husband a divorce. He said, you do? Who said he wants to give you? He wants to take it. She said, you have to convince him. He said, I will not. I will not. And you can stop pitying yourself. You have a good head. And you have to have. Now, I'm going to tell you one thing. You don't know how to daven. She says, I don't know how to daven. She said, that's all I do. It's bad enough that I'm a cripple. So I should, when my husband comes in, just cry and be like the voice of doom, like gloomy, gloomy, a, a water, like say a water pot. I can't do that to him. That's it's enough that I am what I am. And I smile, even though my heart is broken, and I put a smile. I Believe me, I work hard to put that smile on my face, and I share with him all kinds of nice things I read and all kinds of nice things that I thought up and I write sometimes and I share with him. 
He says, no, that's not enough. No, 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 I'm going to scold you. No. She said, so what should I do? He said, you have to hope. You don't hope enough. Where's the hope? What do you want from Hashem? He knows your tzaris. He knows all the things you don't have. What do you want from him? She said, if I could bring my one and only child to the chope, not in a wheelchair, that's all I ask. He said, that's all? That's all? Really? He says, she said, I should be greedy? He said, you think Hashem can give you? She said, not I don't think. I don't know if I deserve. He said, first you have to ask. It's for him to decide if you deserve. You have to ask. She said, so what should I ask for? You tell me. He said, you ask that you should dance at all your children's weddings. Children. The doctor said I can't have any more children. That's why I want to give my Moshe a divorce. A cripple for a wife and no more children. He deserves better. I can do it to him. He said, no, you have a choice. You can start to hope and do something. Hope moves a person. Hope. When you hope, you don't sit still. You do. She said, I'm leaving here and you start hoping and doing. And it was then that she decided to go to the warm springs near Germany. And she started to get the sensation back in her feet. And when she left the mirror, she was walking. But no kinderlach. The years went by, he was an only child. And when he was eight years old, she had a strange, her body started to change. We have all, even our young girls understand, she stopped getting her machzor and she was very worried. If anything, my aunt read about every single thing they, they could read about in medicine. That she could have been, a, like you say, a physician assistant, you know, packed every test. Something is growing inside me. She said to my uncle, Meisha, I'm very, very worried. I can't have any more children. And I read that when sometimes cancer, when it appears, it's people think that it's a pregnancy. Da, 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 da. She, she said, well, there's only way to find out and you'll have to have the courage. She went to the doctor and the doctor said, Mrs. Shane, you're right. Something is growing inside you. You're having a baby. <laughs> He said, I don't believe you. He said, well, time will tell, huh? <laughs> <laughs> There's nothing I hope to oh. And she had a Maybelle, and a few years later, a Yingale. And she danced at all their weddings. I only tell it to you for Chizuk. I beg you. Let the hope you carry in your heart, always move you. And do every single thing you can. Like you say, to live with the courage that, is, that Hashem gave each and every one. Every year has courage. Hashem gave us such good genes, ladies. When we think back of what we went through as a people, who oh, and that's another story about that colored fellow I told you. But I don't know what, I don't want to repeat stories that I already told. <laughs> my nurse, my nurse, I had a nurse who was a psychiatric nurse and the head of a department in one of the biggest hospitals in New York, drug addiction. And over her station, she had the posuk. That's chapter 27 of Tehillim, the last posuk. Kadeh Hashem, chazak v'yamei silbecho v'kadeh Hashem. 
written in Hebrew letters, translated into English. And then, when she was 35 years old, she came into the room to her, her station, and she said, all male, all male, between the ages of 18 and 40, drug addiction, maybe 30, 30 something, under 40. And she said, wish me happy, I'm leaving. And they said, Miss Zelda, this tall, good looking, colored fellow, six feet five, he was the head of the basketball team. I don't think he had to do much. He just sort of jumped a little to the ball. And, but he got hooked. And he said, you're not leaving. You can't leave us. She said, a wonderful nurse is coming in my place. I'm 35 years old. I finally found myself, like you say, a uh, khatan. Uh, well, as you say, said in English, a, you know, a fiancé. And I want to have some babies and bring them up. So you get married, you have babies, and you stay. <laughs> he says, she said, what do you, look, you had a wonderful nurse coming in my place. They said, Miss Zelda, no one can come see me, your place. When I came here, I hated Jews. I'm colored. And I'm enough different. And I'm not going to be more different. But nobody likes Jews. So I don't like Jews either. She said, you know any Jews? She said, he says, I don't have to know. All I know is that Jews are not popular. Nobody likes Jews. Everyone blames Jews. You know, he says, but then you come and you upset the apple cart. You know, the whole apple cart turned over because you're Jewish and you confuse me. And I didn't like being confused. I don't like it. I have a good head. Despite you think I'm on drugs, I don't know. I'm a very smart fellow. And I could start to read. I got plenty of time in this place to read. So I read about all kinds of empires and they all fell. The Roman Empire, the Babylonian Empire, the Roman Empire, the Grecian Empire, the Persian Empire, then the Greece, Grecian Empire, then the, the then the, then the and, and they all they all the Roman Empire up and down, up and down. And still there's always Jews, always Jews from way back. And I think to myself, why? And then you told us why. You helped us to understand that they never give up hope. So you can't leave us. Anyway, she did leave. And she had four beautiful boys. When she came to be Menachem Mother, when I lost my husband, she was in heritage soil, and she came to be Menachem Mother to pay me a condolence for it. And she says she's very happy. She they met, got married. I said, you still work? She said, I don't know if yet, but the boys are getting bigger. She said, I'll probably be going back. All right, that's all. Please look. Now we come to what I want to say. <laughs> <laughs> I want to talk about a special, a special quality now that I think is very important for us, a very important mida. Uh, uh, and it's called la vir al midot. It says la vir al hamidot. La vir kol mishe ma vir al midotav, a kodesh borhu ma vir gam al midotav. If we overlook how we feel, and we don't pay back, we put ours aside, and we're still kind to our fellow man, though he hurt us, or he disappointed us, or he frustrated us, or he angered us. We put that aside and try to understand and forgive. 
Hashem will give us back the same. He'll put aside the agenda he has against us and forgive. It's called the Havil Almidotab. It's a special midah quality. And it's called the Havil Almidotab. To pass over and push aside our agenda and not to give back to hurt or to bear a grudge. We don't have to forget because forgetting sometimes self-preservation, we need it, but to forgive and try to understand and overlook or not take it personally, whichever category you want to use with all of, or maybe a little of everything. <clears throat> and then Hashem will say, if you can be big enough to overlook and to put aside, then so can, then that's what we have to learn from you. And I want to share with you a few stories. I want to share, I share a story from my father. My father had a printer's safer. The boys in the yeshiva helped raise some money. He borrowed some money. And he brought it to the father of his very special student who had a printing business. Let's call him his student, Menachem Mendel. This is his first name, so I don't think anyone can ever, you know, from a first name, in case there's anybody, I don't know, maybe related. Now, he brought him away the whole money because he said, if it's going to be in the house, we never have money. My wife might have sort of, you know, dip her hands a little bit, take a little bite, a little here and a little here and a little there, and it'll never come back. So I'm giving you the whole money. When should I come back for the first fruit of the Sefer? It was my father's first Sefer. My father wrote beautiful Sforim, but this was his first Sefer. It was called Tabat HaHoshen on the Hoshen Mishpah. On the Gemara, that Kailek of the Gemara Hoshen Mishpah. Called Tabat HaHoshen. He said, come back in six weeks. Came back in six weeks. And he says to him, uh, well, you know, he said, I'll tell you, I really didn't start. He said, but you told me to come back. He said, but you never gave me money. My father says, I never gave you money. I gave you? What do you mean I never gave you money? He said, no. My father says, I borrowed, I... The boys raised money for me. He said, well, listen, they're not going to say no. I'm not going to go ask each boy. I don't want to humiliate you, but I can't. You didn't give me any money. My father said, I, we knew nothing. I didn't know anything. I was a teenager. I just saw my mother crying. When she was cooking, my mother took a lot to make my mother cry. She went a young girl, 17, to Europe. You had to read the book to know how hard it was to leave her family. She was so happy. And my Sadie and Bobby were special. All my grandmother was so special. She had such a sense of humor. She had five brothers, university graduates. All they did was come on Sunday to just speak to my to my my to their sister. Her name was Adel, Adina. She had a sense of humor, why, 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 why? My, just to give you an example, my, my mother's only brother, Nachum David Herman, he once had pneumonia in the hospital. He was in the hospital. In those days, they didn't have anything for pneumonia. And uh, he, my Bobby, he, my, my, my mother also had a sense of humor. But my uncle, why, why? He said, they, they asked him, do you remember on what side it was? You know, there's two lungs. 
He said, well, let me think. He said, yeah, it was on the Lower East Side. <laughs> <laughs> That's where they live. He was, well, they were, he, my, anyway. So, we were, I was telling about my, uh, about the money. Yeah, the money. My father, mm -hmm. yeah. So what happened? So my father said, what should I do? I I I gave you. He said, I'm sorry, Rabbi. I don't remember you giving me anything. My mother, I said, was crying, and I asked my mother, and she good. For the next few months, all I knew was that my father was paying back the money he borrowed. The book never got printed. The years went by. Took a long time for him to raise again the money and print the safe, but we never did know. When that Talmud's father was dying, we first found out what happened. What happened? It seems that the printing business was failing and it, he didn't have money. And he and my father came in and, and gave him $500 to print the safe book. He borrowed, unfortunately, from the mafia. Ladies, the mafia is not such a, you know, what shall I tell you? They're, they're not a kind organization. Let's put it that way. They, 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 there's a lot of cruelty in the mafia. It depends. One thing I'll tell you, the mafia never lets their daughters marry any mafia men. They make sure they marry Jewish lawyers and Jewish accountants because they work with, they treat themselves, the mafia, to the best they can get. So they always have Jewish lawyers and Jewish I was in a, a, a hotel one time that had, we had a wedding and I come downstairs to the bathroom a beautiful bathroom, like a with perfumes and sprays and a hair dryer, all in the bathroom. She said, "Well, some people like to come and take a shower. They come from work." This woman is sitting with a mink jacket. She says, "I own this place." I said, "Oh, I don't know." She's sitting downstairs in this with a very elegantly dressed mink jacket slung over her shoulder. She says, um, "Yeah," she says. Uh, I'm not Jewish, but my my son-in-law is Jewish. He's he's a lawyer. They found out she she they map he owns owns that uh, that particular hall. In fact, in Bensonhurst, where that hall was, you never see a colored person. If they see that mafia doesn't like the colored. So there's no color in that area. They control the whole area there. That whole town, that bull was owned by a mafia. A mafia. At least she was from the mafia. I don't know. She said her son-in-law never lifts a hand. He treats her like a queen. And his wife, he never lifted a hand to a wife. His wife, I thought, you know, by the goyim, the first thing, uh, like you say, I am your day, but by it, we don't we don't use our hands so much. I die. We have a call called Yaakov. I die the We don't. They hit. They use. There's the they. Now, my father never we never found out what happened until he was on his deathbed. His Talmud's father, my father came back. He never said a word. He told my mother, he never knew what happened. As I said, for the next few months, even the one place you meal we had, we didn't have. A supper by us many times with just an egg, scrambled egg. Mama sometimes served it on toast like Welsh rabbit, you know, and a little cheese that she melted. That was 
that was our meal for months and months. So we paid, they paid off the debt. It took another quite a few years for my father again to raise the money. But he thinks he says that his 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 mat his at sloche with the safer was due to the fact that he never said anything. He was my dear Almido Never said a word. I said to him later when we found out what happened, that the money was given to the mafia to save the business that the father told on his deathbed to his son, my father's Talmud. And I said, so Papa, why couldn't you have said something to him? My father says, I would have broken him. I couldn't do it to my tongue. To break him, either his father is a liar or his Rebbe is a liar. Someone is lying. I couldn't do it. So I said nothing. That's why I feel I'm To put your thing, your issue aside. And not to hurt someone. We had a story with my father-in-law. My father-in-law was a rov in the Bronx for 45 years. And when he retired, there, he, he also, you say, when he was a rov before, he was, he was in the shul, it must have been about 40 years already. A man came to the shul and said, I have five children. I came from Europe. I get to the big shul. Could you help me maybe and give me a stick of pie nuts? My father-in-law said, look, there's not really an opening. Let me speak to the Gabbai. He's an older man. Maybe he doesn't want to retire yet, but maybe you could be an assistant. And he asked the Gabbai, and the Gabbai says, look, I, I'm, I have, I'm an older man, but I still I have grandchildren. I want to help my grandchildren. He said, would you want to help her? He said, if the shoe will pay, my grandfather, my father-in-law raised money. And he spoke to the board and they said, look, we'll do our best. We can't give much, but we'll try. And he took me as an assistant, this man that came. And she started to make malaga malkas and all kinds of things. And, you know, ingratiate herself with the people. And he, can I help you? Can I do something for you? And little by little, he started to, to say to the Gabbai, you know, maybe you want to retire. You know, you're getting to be an older man. He says, well, I still have years that I'm willing to work. But he went and he spoke to the board and he said, why do you need it? Shul is depleting. The Bronx is becoming more, you know, black. Not black like black hats and black jackets. <laughs> You know, so what do we need? Uh, an assistant, Shamis and this, he's already an older man. And he helped literally push him out. They retired him. They gave him a small pension. And, you know, it's not pleasant to be told we don't need you. And we have you know, young blood. And this young blood was very, I just say, turbulent and stupid. And, and then... He became the, so he became the Gabbai. And then as the shul started, they met the Bronx started to get less and less. And my father-in-law was getting older. He said, what do you need the rabbi? You know, I can also give a drusha one time, Shabbos. I can also uh, fill in. I, you know, I, have, I, I also learned in Europe. I, and he literally helped to push my father-in-law out. And there was a law that my father-in-law, if the shul ever gets sold, my father-in-law would be the one 
because of so many years of service, he was there by 45 years, he would get the money. And he came before the board and said, I'm the acting rabbi. It says the, uh, the rabbi now. So he said to my father, no, I was then married. And we, my husband was learning. My father, my husband was learning. My brother-in-laws were learning. We were the Albany Taylor. We needed, we could have used that money. He said uh, to my father, Abba. He told him, Abba. You're not going to uh, untest. He, he's going to take the whole money. He says he's the acting rabbi. He says the rabbi that was here, he wasn't here all the years. He's here only the last maybe 12 years. You're here. You're here, you're here 45 years. He said, I'll ruin him. He has five children. Three of them are in Shidduchim. If I'll take him to a dentary, it's gonna make an awful smell. It's gonna, it's gonna, we're gonna find out that he pushed out the shamus, and now he's gonna push out me, and it's, it's no good. I can do it, not for money. He said, "But Abba, you deserve it. You were here so many years. You built up the whole shul, and you're the, you were the Abba, the rabbi. He's just now, he just." Now, now became, like you say, trying to heal and be the acting rabbi. And he took the money. That's called my view on me, daughter. My father-in-law said, no, I can't. I can't do it. I'll ruin all the Shadduchim for him. You'll get a name, a name like he's a, he push it, push it, push, you know, push it, he's like a, a Poshaya. It's, it's criminal things that he's doing. Can't have that on my conscience. Here again, we see a story. But me la vira mi daughter. It's not easy. To forget your agenda and have pity on us. But it's a beginning. There's a very nice story, and I think you probably know it. It's a very, very sweet story. And I put it down here also to share with you also another story. It happened in a yeshiva. They went out, they were about nine years old, the boys, and he got a new watch. Well, the watch, you know, you probably heard. He got a new watch, and he didn't want to go play ball with it. You know, maybe it would break, or maybe it would fall off. He left it on the desk. And came back from recess. It was gone. It was gone. Someone took the watch. But who? So the Rebbe said like this. You all line up and you close your eyes. Everyone, I'll go up and down the aisle, just up and down in a row to see that you all your eyes are closed. No one is going to cheat. And everyone is going to stand like this. And whoever took the watch is going to come and put the watch back in that boy's hand. And so the boy got his watch back. And no one knew who took the watch. He spared the boy that took it, the humiliation and the shame of taking it. 
Years later, a young, he was already, he must have been a man in his 40s, maybe middle aged, early middle age, came to the Rebbe. He was, he came, he lived not in that area. And he came in, he said, I must tell you that what you did all those years ago made such an impression on me that I stayed. I was not such a such a really firm yeshiva boy. And there were many times I was willing, like you say, to sacrifice some of my Yiddish kites. I went to a not easy time. And I remembered what you did. A Rebbe, a Rebbe, a firm Rebbe. And that made on me such an impression. It kept me from giving up some of those Torah values that are not so easy to keep. You spared me that humiliation. You know about the watch, remember? He said, oh yes, he said. But you see, I also closed my eyes. <laughs> I didn't want to see who did it. Should you came now to tell me I didn't know it was you? Yeah, I've got to get you back for somebody else to get you back to stand for the board and the ladies. Could you imagine the ladies? You never knew. Even the Rebbe never knew until he came to tell him that it, that it made such an impression on me. That it helped him to retain, like you say, if a, if a person of Rebbe could have that kind of fortitude and that kind of understanding, can be my view, Amido Tab also. There was an agenda here. I mean, he could have. And to use such, such a, 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 such kindness and such, such strategy to save someone humiliation and bucha and shame. And when you see again just how much it matters to be my veal, Amidotav, to put you aside and find a way not to pay back or not to make him suffer or not to be the one, like you say, to punish. Leave it, like you say, find other ways. Not to hurt. Yeah. I want to share with you another story because it's getting late. <laughs> Here again, a father told his daughter, 11 o'clock curfew. In at home, the door's locked. He warned her once and twice. She was a 17, 18 year old teenager and she was running around with a fast crowd. Boys, girls, face. Not such a happy matzo. And he said, no. The door stays gonna be locked. And she came home at one in the morning. And the door was locked. And she banged and she banged. And her father came out and he said, the door stays locked. You can spend the night sitting on the stoop. I don't open the door. And then he came out with a warm like blanket and a tray with a drink and fruit and some crackers. And he sat with the door didn't open. 
but he sat with her till the morning. Because I can't leave you alone. All right? No. The neighborhood was not a neighborhood that you could do these things. Sat with her the whole morning. But the door stayed locked. Only he sat with her. And he made sure that she was warm. She had what to drink in it. There are very many ways that we now view our middle family, that we put our feelings aside, try and understand, not be the one to pay back. In fact, as Yidin, we add on the after everyone that's killed in action, Hashem Yikom Damam. May Hashem take my Hashem take revenge. We don't. Hashem Yikom Damam. We never take revenge. We fight, we're in a war, but to revenge. Hashem is a God of vengeance. He pays back, not we. How do we know why and when and how? How many boys sometimes, even we have stories, even of the Goyim, how much they were forced that into the army. How little do we know? The story of this Russian colonel, and it was unfinished. There's a Russian colonel sitting in a kosher restaurant. And no one sat near him. The Russians were not very were not very popular. They're tough breeds, the Russians. I remember the hospital. And I was four months in hospital after an accident, very serious accident. I was run over by a car that went, that went through a light. The car stopped for me, it was green. And he passed and went over me and did a terrible job. So I was in the hospital four months, and then a month, I still couldn't put my foot down. Five months, I couldn't put my foot down. And one and a half, my daughter, the day I came out here. Anyway, let's go back to the others. This it was just, it was a day and a half later that my husband was Mr. But going back to the story with this Russian colonel. And the Chavetz Chaim spoke in that city. And it was, it was a kosher restaurant. And it was all taken, except for that Russian colonel. No one wanted to sit me. It was in Poland. The Russians, the Russians did not such good things to the Poles. And the Poles, the Poles were also not Sabican. They also hated Jews. But this was in Poland, it was after the war. And the Russians had a very bad name. And he sat down next to the Russian. And he said to him, why are you sitting here? He said to the Chavetz Chaim, you're a holy man. And so many people would get up, why do you sit next to me here? He said, I'll tell you why. I'm wondering what a Russian colonel is doing in a kosher restaurant. That's one. What made you sit here? What brings you here? Look at all those medals that you have. You're a very special person. What are you doing in a kosher restaurant? You can be sitting in I don't know where and having the 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 prestige and the honor. Yeah, look. Steady. I'll tell you why I'm here. Mm -hmm. 
I was seven years old when I left the ghetto with my elder brother. We had to get medicine and it was not in the ghetto. We had to go outside the ghetto to a very big drugstore to get the medicine. My mother was very sick. And the cantonistim, they two people, they saw me and they put a big, big bag over me and they dragged me away and they sold me to a Russian couple. And the Russian couple had no children. It was a business. They used to hug Jewish kids because Jewish kids have good heads and they're smart and they know how to read and write. And they sold them to childless couples and I was sold mm -hmm. to a Russian couple. They were very good to me. I told them I'll never like them. Never, 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 never. And I'll never eat in their house. And I'll never, I'll never. And I cried. And they said, how can we make you happy? We paid a lot of money for you. We want you to like us. We have no children. We we'll give you everything, everything. I said, I won't eat by you. Never, never, never. Pork, that's chaza, no. And I won't work on Shabbos. I'm a Jewish boy, no, no. I didn't want, I didn't want. And they said that they won't give me any meat. I shouldn't worry, only fish. And not only that, they said, they said that they won't work on Saturday. I wouldn't have to work on Saturday. They were so good to me. I gave them a lot of nachos. I was smart. And I didn't care if I lived or died. That's why I have so many medals. I went on the worst missions, the most dangerous missions. I thought that I'll find my parents in, in heaven, in, in, in Olam Haba, in Ghanaian because they'll probably be there also. And when it came to a shidduch, they brought the most beautiful girl, pretty and sweet and nice, but they were going, they were shiksis. I remember from home that my mother would say, oh, Yibald, oh, Yibald, he married a shiksa, oh. And I didn't want to marry anybody. They were so good to me. But you see all my medals? I was never afraid. I knew that one day I'd meet my parents in Dan Haven, in heaven. So I didn't care, but they were good people. And now he says, I never ate anywhere meat. That's why I'm here, because in such a restaurant, I could eat sometimes something in the meat department. Like this, I wouldn't eat. Soon I'm going to retire, he says. And what's, I'm not, a, I have, I'm, I'm a no man's land. I'm not a goy and I'm not a yid. Where do I go and where do I belong? I never married. My parents are good people, the ones who brought me up. He never worked on a Saturday, on a Shabbos, never. And the Chavetz Chaim took his hand and kissed his hand and said, look what you went through. You were a little boy and how much you tried to keep. You don't have to worry. I'm writing you down my name and where I live and you'll come to me and I'll help you to be the year you want to be and couldn't be all along. And you'll bring your parents to such claim there's a place in Ghanaian. Don't worry. They were good to you. They let you stay a year. They never interfered. 
And he had tears in his eyes and he said, thank you. I hope soon then I'll be seeing you. Here we see how much people need the Chobetz Chaim. What made him sit next to him? What made him take an interest in him? The Chobetz Chaim, the Helika Chobetz Chaim, a Russian colonel. So he's sitting here, Kameis. And to promise him that he should come and take care and he'll take care of him. And that he should take the parents that will go for him. The understanding. See what Mila Vila Midotav would have been a completely different oh, oh, look, where uh, Russia could find out why he's sitting in a kosher. To tell him he can take along his Goyish appearance, the understanding, to, to feel, to feel that he has, he, he's, he, he has the hollow of him. Like you say, he went through a hard time. He never, they were always good to him. He was, they were Goyim. You don't realize what it means. To be so kind and caring and understanding in Matzavim that are not easy. But it's a tremendous, a tremendous mitzvah. And this mitzvah gives us, gives us the thought that Hashem should do the same for us. Like you and my view and your midot and your agenda. So too will I look aside at any of the things that you did that were not so I, I, I. And treat you with pain and chesed, with grace and with compassion. It's Aishana Rabba. We have to learn. Ladies, try to add that your list of qualities that you work on. It's a beautiful mita. And it's a mita that will only give you nachas. Because as you treat others, so will Hashem treat you. I pray that each of you, I know you all darling, I know you all do chesed, but this kind of an union not to give back or to overlook or to push aside resentment or disappointment or frustration or a grudge. I see, I live with families where I see where Mahloik is and grudging and just these things are so alive, it's horrible. And I don't see any nachas by them. The girls don't do shidduchim. There's no pochadim. And my heart hurts for them. Within our own family. So there's an agenda. So, so there's always agendas. There's always issues. There's always Somebody who's going to maybe sometimes say the wrong thing or do the wrong thing or do it at the wrong time or say it at the wrong time or the amount that they do, whatever. If you can learn to put it on the side and not pull back and feel, try to resolve it, realize that each one maybe, who knows, who can judge only one person, not one person, one just has Hashemi's Baruch knows the whole story. Ladies, I want to wish you all a wonderful day. But a year 
where you can work on this Mita, you'll see it's redeeming. It brings so much, so much Menuchas HaNefesh. Of course, everyone has Nefesh, and Nefesh is happy when there is, like you say, Ma'avir, where we can put aside and realize that the Nefesh stays pure and clear, and our conscience, like you say, is clear and clean. You don't know what Bracha you see. So may Hashem bless you all with pain and chesed and bracha adli dai. You have to earn it, ladies, and this is one of the most wonderful. The first time our own feelings, we try to understand and resolve whatever is not so to say they inside, but not to come back. You have to understand being calm to his to be a grudge. Because I think the two hardest loving in the whole Torah as low si kom below si tor. Not to be a grudge. Low si tor means to hold on to a grudge. Low si kom already I think is easier after that. But low si tor. How many times people have come. I work a lot in Yayuts. I have degrees. Rebison, you don't know what he did to me. You don't know, you don't know. Rebison, Rebison, Rebison. Husbands, wives, parents, children, children, parents. Wherever there's human relationships, I find this very alive. Hey, Hashem, help us. Like you say, to earn his regard. In this area, to help Hashem overlook whatever we did wrong or what we didn't do or what we should have done. Remember, we're not just judged what we did wrong, but what we could have done right. And that's a much bigger, that's the big area, that's the hard part. What we could have done right. And if we try in this area, We'll see what Bracha will come. Amen. Hashem should help. And it should be a year of Bracha. And look, already, already Hashem made us a little happy in the Sukkot's nose. We yeah, sing by in his yeah. grave. And have you had his body? Yeah, that's the better part. Mm. The, the body, right? <laughs> The rabbit has got it. This the one yantit that it says, V'samachta b'chagecha. It's a mitzvah to say to be happy and sukkah. A mitzvah, you hear? Just to be happy. And Hashem helped us. I mean, we got to hold that simba. We didn't even know it. No, we didn't. No. Thank you, thank you, thank you, everybody. I don't hear it. Oh, the envelope, yes. Okay, so if anybody hasn't put anything in the envelope, you please welcome to. I have to tell you that we all know that Rebison Altitsky knows how to use this really for everybody else. And I know, um, Mrs. Weiss, I know that um, the Rebison would like to see, just tell Mrs. Weiss not to leave before the Rebison sees yeah. him. Okay, and I just want to say thank you um, to everybody. Thank you to the Rebison and thank you to the stones. If anybody wants to make a bracha in there, and if anybody doesn't yet have a magnet, please take one, put it on your fridge and give it to others to put on their fridges. And I do have the story, but it's just not uh, how you say. If you want to, if you want to pick a copy of the actual story, just message me and I'll send it to you. Oh yeah, yeah. Of this magazine. 
And if anybody is here that lives in Stanford Hill, going to Stanford Hill, um, you can have extra your fitness with the Robertson, otherwise I'm going to book it here. Let me down because I want to write it down. Thank you, Hannah. Oh, there. Oh, there. Oh, there. Oh, there. Oh, there's the end of my project. Yeah, I thought that if you need to get a scan, just give me a check. Yeah, you can play a match. Yeah, you can play a match. Yeah, you can play a match. Yeah, you can play a match.